And welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are with the man and the legend, Mr. Joel Skousen. Now, for those of you who somehow have been living under a rock and don't know, Joel Skousen is the publisher of World Affairs Brief, a weekly internet news analysis service. He is a political scientist by training, specializing in foreign policy, as well as philosophy of law, free market economics, and U.S. constitutional theory. His main area of research focuses on helping his readers understand the hidden globalist agenda behind U.S. foreign and domestic policy. He has developed a working theory to explain the West's conflicting policies of both supporting and attacking at different times and places. Contradictory positions, for example, terrorism, communist-backed revolutions, drug, money laundering, uh, organized crime, things like this that we seem to kind of be involved with. But when it comes to here... You know, shame on you if you're involved in any of that. Mr. Skousen um, also possesses a very broad background in various disciplines, which allows him to analyze geopolitical issues from personal experience, which is very important. His um, former career as a Marine fighter pilot officer and fighter pilot during the Vietnam era leaves him familiar, intimately familiar with uh, security and defense issues. Now, during the 1980s, he served as the chairman of the Conservative National Committee in Washington, D.C. This left him with a lot of different connections, uh, both domestically and abroad. Uh, Joel also speaks several, several languages. He uh, is a world traveler and reads extensively, man after my own heart. Now, Joel's main career for the last 40 years has been designing high-security residences and retreats across North America, including safe rooms, alternative power systems. He is the author of four books, one on law and governance, and three on his special design innovations in security architecture and strategic relocation. His websites are worldaffairsbrief.com and joelskousen.com. Mr. Skousen, that was a Heck of a resume. I am so freaking pleased to have you on the program. Welcome on, sir. Well, thank you. It's uh, good to be with you, especially in these times when, I mean, the whole world has been turned upside down with this is, uh, this exaggerated pandemic. Uh, it looks like there's no end in sight. They want to keep us with mask mania and social distancing and, uh, you know, and parts of this economy are just not going to suffer. I mean, big restaurants can't operate with social distancing. You know, the Sunset Restaurant in New Jersey closed down with at 85 employees and 3,000 square feet. They just couldn't operate with six feet apart between tables, and uh, it was just tragic. And it's happening all over the world. You know, unfortunately, it really does seem like we are under attack right now. Um, now, I'm kind of hoping that things turn out positively in the coming election. I think that if uh, President Trump can be reelected, we can kind of stave off things and at least have more of a, a fighting chance, economically speaking. But I am unfortunately afraid that if we get a president that wants to just tax us to high heaven, we aren't going to make it. I mean, what's your theory on this? Well, I think it's very unlikely, even though I'm in favor of Donald Trump being reelected, it's very unlikely given the, first of all, He barely won last time in the swing districts, and these swing districts have all gone Democratic in the 2016 election. In addition, we graduated four more years of left liberal students out of the public schools and out of the public universities, which are adding to the Democratic roles. Now, to be sure, the Trump supporters are really energized. I mean, Joe Biden can't bring in more than 30 or 40 people to come hear him speak from Donald Trump has to turn them away after thousands. But the, the, the bad news is, unfortunately, Donald Trump, though he has some good instincts, he really doesn't have a, a, a conservative uh, background. He doesn't understand the deep state. Uh, for example, he, he replaced James Comey, who was deep state, with Christopher Wray, who was deep state. He replaced Jeff Sessions with Bill Barr, who was deep state. And he's showing his true colors now by not prosecuting anyone even under the Durham saying, we're not going to release any of this data before the election. It's, uh, you know, he's played loyal to Trump, but he isn't loyal to Trump. He's, uh, he's just playing a game. And, uh, and Donald Trump, unfortunately, because he's never studied conspiracy became, became president, 
I mean, he recognizes it when it attacks him, but because he doesn't know anybody in Washington, doesn't know any conspir- uh, any conservatives, he has to go out to his mainstream and deep state advisors to ask who he should put in position. I mean, it's just like Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court. Now, it's true he had a reputation as a conservative jurist, but he was deep state. He was number two in the Ken Starr cover-up of the Vince Foster murder and the federal government calling it a suicide. And he was the one who was in charge of intimidating the witnesses that came before the commission with countering the official story. And, you know, bless her heart, Amy Barrett, you know, is kind of a mainstream Republican. Um, She's not going to overturn anything. She has backed government in 100% of her cases. She backed big corporations in 100% of her cases. And she said in the, in the hearings, you know, I'm just going to obey uh, stare decisis, which means court precedent. And unfortunately, that's not the Constitution. Court precedent, you know, is at the court interpret. So I am not optimistic that even if Trump wins, that we're going to restore any liberty or drain the swamp. What Trump has done, however, in the last four years, he's slowed down the globalist agenda in most areas because he keeps changing his mind. I mean, you know, he wants to get out of Syria. They talk him out of it, and then he changes his mind. They have to talk him out of it again. He wants to get out of Afghanistan, and they talk him out of it. He changes his mind. They're always battling back and forth. That's why they want him out. They want a puppet in there like George H.W. Bush or Barack Obama uh, or Bill Clinton. These people take orders. They know who's the boss when they come in. But Donald Trump really tried to be president. It's unfortunate he just didn't have the experience to fight this deep state effectively. Now, when you talk about the deep state, this is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I know most of our listeners as well, and a lot of people don't really understand what it is. Um, Can you give us just a brief kind of definition, in your opinion, of what the deep state actually is? Yes. The deep state is the enforcement arm of a larger globalist conspiracy to take away American sovereignty and get us into a militarized global government. That's what the deep state is. It infests every single federal law enforcement agency and has controls and tentacles under every democratic and and large metro area. I'll say that. And most, almost almost every large metro area is controlled by the Democrats. They control coroners. They can falsify death certificates. They can cover up for uh, murders by the deep state and call it a suicide, as they do often. But, you know, most people think the deep state is simply a bunch of Obama holdovers in the Trump administration that are trying to get rid of President Trump. It's not that. It's a lethal, deadly organization. It killed JFK. It killed Robert F. Kennedy. It killed Martin Luther King for their, not because he wasn't a leftist, he was, but Martin Luther King was so sexually uninhibited. He was with prostitutes almost every night. It was going to eventually come out and get him totally discredited. So they killed him for the martyr effect in order to make him a hero, even though he was unworthy of being a hero in the United States. The United States covered, the deep state covered up for the TWA shoot down, which was a Navy missile shoot gone awry. They covered up for 9-11, which was a deep state operation from beginning to end, including the hiring of the terrorists and the loading explosives in the World Trade Center. Terrorists couldn't have done that. And the terrorists couldn't have covered up for all this. It was the government that covered up. Why would they be covering up for something that terrorists did unless they were involved? But in my website, Joel Skousen or worldaffairsbrief.com, I've got a section on the left-hand side, which talks about all these major conspiracies that I think are factual conspiracies, not just theories, including 9-11. And your listeners can take a read. It's free to read. And uh, my World Affairs Brief, by the way, each week is from the point of view of what the deep state is doing under the table. I'm probably the top expert in the nation on what conspiracy has done in this country. And uh, uh, there is a modest subscription fee for the World Affairs Brief of a dollar a week, uh, $48 a year. But people can get a free sample issue, your listeners, by emailing me at editor at worldaffairsbrief.com. This Friday, I'm going to be covering the latest uh, spectacular news that has come out from the AMP Fest about this whistleblower, Alan Perot, who claims to be CIA insider that Osama bin Laden was kept in Iran for 10 years. And I'm explaining in the brief why that's all disinformation. 
That's exactly and what I thought when I heard that as well. Something rang in my head. I said, that doesn't sound right. That's right. Yeah. Now, now Nick No, who was former military, who worked at uh, Rheinstedt Air Force Base and uh, in Germany and has inf information about Benghazi, he's right on the money. He's sincere. And so is Charles Woods, the father of uh, Ty Woods, who was killed in Benghazi. That part is true. But, you know, the deep state always liked to put a disinformation expert and piggyback on sincere people. So you start out with the truth that gets conservatives hooks. And then you throw in this guy who claims to be a falconer with the Saudis for, for 20 years. And then suddenly you realize he's talking about they tasked me with taking out Osama bin Laden and Iran. You know, this isn't just a falconer. This is a guy who's working deep inside. And then you realize as I do, remember that there are no insiders or no whistleblowers of the CIA that are allowed to talk about real secrets or they get killed and they are threatened. Yeah. yeah. He'd never be able to reveal these things unless they permit it. And the only reason they would permit it is because it's false. And the target, of course, is to make Iran the boogeyman. They keep feeding Trump every week with anti-Iranian information. In point of fact, Soleimani, who Iran, who Trump ignorantly allowed to be taken out by the deep state, was not the biggest terrorist in the world. He was, in fact, at the forefront in Iran and Iraq of fighting U.S.-backed terror. U.S. <laughs> created ISIS. They created al-Qaeda. Uh, Osama bin Laden was a, um, <clears throat> a CIA asset. He had kidney disease. He died in 2002. They falsified the killing of Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan, by killing his CIA double mm -hmm. that they've been using ever since Obama died, or Osama died, in order to take credit for 9-11, which he didn't do. It was, a 9 it was a deep state operation. I mean, this is just a tremendously complex world of deceit and lies that we live in. And that's one of the reasons why I publish this World Affairs Brief every week in order to add some clarity to it. And it really is an amazing website. Um, and I'm not just saying that I was on there last night looking around and I was actually reading a little bit of what you were writing about um, the Bible and law and kind of scripture as it relates okay. to law and doesn't relate to law as it turns out. And uh, I really thought that it was, I mean, it was just such a well thought out piece. And for all of you guys and girls out there at home, I mean, just going over and checking out what's publicly available on his website is going to give you so much insight to just what's going on in the world. And really, it, it's a very, very interesting read. So I appreciate you putting that out there. Thank you. Now, Mr. Skousen, the pandemic is something that you and I spoke about briefly before we jumped on here. Um, and I think we're both on the same page about this as far as the uh, lack or, well, the taking away of our liberties, to speak plainly, sir. Um, now, do you think that this is something that was a biological weapon from China at all, or what's your theory on this? Well, this originated with the deep state in the United States, and Dr. Fauci works for them, in my opinion. Hmm. He had given certain monetary, large million-dollar grants to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to work on enhancement of function of the coronavirus to create a bioweapon from it. And Congress found out about it in 2014 and cut off the funding, said this is inappropriate for taxpayer funding. So what did Fauci do? He took $700 million of the NIH money and funded the Wuhan lab in China to continue the same research. Now, I think the globalists did this because they knew that the sloppy protocols in China in their bioweapons labs would eventually allow it to be leaked out. So mm -hmm. China would get the blame, but in fact, the globalists wanted it to happen. And now, to, to, I'm not absolving China in this. China has been working on biological weapons for decades. I covered in the World Affairs Brief uh, the 2011 speech by General Hao Tian, the Defense Minister of China. His speech to the Politburo was leaked to the Epic Times, uh, an anti-communist Chinese publication. Um, and he talked about how ruthless they were going to be. He said, oh, the Nazis, you know, have nothing on us. They were too, too permissive with the West. We are going to be ruthless. We are going to cleanse all of North America and Canada of people because we need the living space. We're going to use biological weapons. We're going to use nuclear weapons. We are going to be ruthless. And I'll tell you, if anybody 
knows about the Oriental's propensity for torture, you just have to look at the Vietnamese torture of U.S. prisoners of war, the Chinese torture of U.S. prisoners and Japanese prisoners during their war. There's nothing more evil. You don't want to live under a Chinese occupation. And so it's my opinion that it was a, um, it was both the Chinese fault and the, the globalists that uh, are our, our own internal enemies that were at fault in this. And it has been the globalists, the deep state, that has pushed this into a false pandemic. By, they, they implemented two things. Number one, they developed a test through Dr. Drosten in Germany that had no sample of the actual virus. He simply took a computer model of a coronavirus RNA and he developed a test that would detect that. And then he used the PCR, which is a amplification or multiplication. It's not a test at all. What it does is it break, the polymerase uh, technique breaks down DNA into its RNA component parts and then knits it back together and then breaks it down, knits it back together and amplifies it so that you get larger and larger quantities it's a multiplication thing. And the maximum that you're allowed to take that is 45 multiplications. Anything, the, 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 the Carrie Mullis, uh, who, who invented the test, got a Nobel Prize for it, said, this is not to be used for diagnosing disease because it multiplies things. It makes it look worse than what it really is. So if you're gonna do a corona, a false pandemic, you wanna make it look worse than it is, then you use a PCR test. Mm. You he says anything over 35 gives you false readings. And that's why they have it up at 45 times. So that's the first thing is pick a test that will show more positives than are out there. And the second thing they did is give financial incentives to the hospitals in America to name every death a COVID death. Mm -hmm. In other words, as you may have heard, you know, the, CD, the, the National Committee on Health Statistics came out and admitted, I think it was in September, that only 6% of those that were diagnosed as dying from COVID actually died from COVID-19 without the presence of comorbidity with other chronic diseases. And I'll tell you that of those 6% that died of purely COVID, most of those, if not all of those, were immunodeficient mm. because normal healthy people simply don't get very sick. They'll have mild flu symptoms, but that's it. They're easily overcome. And if you take you don't need the hydroxychloroquine or any of the drugs. You just take multiple mega doses of vitamin C, vitamin D3, and zinc, and it gets rid of it in a couple of days. Hmm. But most people are unhealthy, and if you take the flu shot, your, your immune system is compromised because shots, especially the yearly flu shot, does have adjuvants in it, which make your body more susceptible. because It dumbs down the immune system so it doesn't attack the, uh, the vaccine. Hmm. And that's what these adjuvants do. So that's why we've got a, a pandemic. The lockdown is a mistake. Um, it was done purposely to disadvantage Donald Trump. Um, and it was also done, I think, to prepare Americans. The, the price of being free from this mask mania and the social distancing stuff is going to be to take a vaccine. And you don't want to take that vaccine. It's an RNA vaccine that pumps out antibodies, they say, virtually 100% of everyone that's had a full dose in the trials of the Moderna vaccine has had serious side effects. Hmm. And they're still saying it's safe. I mean, it's just, I mean, they've got immunity. The Vaccine Regulatory Commission is full of vaccine makers on the very committee that's going to judge the safety of a vaccine. I mean, this is a conflict of interest that is just out the window. So that's my feeling on the, um, the COVID thing. They no, don't tend to let us free until you take a vaccine, but the vaccine won't work. So let's say you're still not free because you got to keep taking it every year. Now, what about domestically here? I mean, I want to ask you first, I want to circle back around to that question, but what other players do you look at right now on the world uh, stage? And what other enemies do you think that are lurking out there besides China? Or is China kind of the main threat right now? Well, actually... Russia's the bigger technical threat because Russia has by far the most nuclear weapons, hypersonic re-entry warheads and throw weight. Um, they got the new ballistic missiles that have 415 maneuvering warheads on them. 
So they are the largest threat to a nuclear first strike against our military. Now, China is the largest long-term threat, and they are building, and they've already surpassed the United States in their blue water Navy. It's not as high tech as our Navy, uh, but they're continuing, and they're trying to build four aircraft carriers before the um, middle of this decade. Now, um, North Korea is also a threat, and unfortunately, Donald Trump got snookered, I will say, by the charm offensive of Kim Jong-un, and he was coached by Xi Jinping, who met with Trump at Mar-a-Lago, and came back to China and told all his buddies and said, Trump's a pushover if you flatter him. If you flatter Donald Trump, and you know, Donald Trump can give out flattery too, so he's not only a flatterer, but he can be subject to flattery, as Xi Jinping found out. Mm-hmm. And so he coached Kim and said, just flatter the flatter the devil out of him and he'll be putty in your hands. And Trump was, it was very, very sad to see. And so all of this time since June of last year, when he let him off the hook on the nuclear deal, Kim Jong-un has been building. He just showcased this new mega missile, which is a very large intercontinental ballistic missile with multiple warheads on it. And that's what he's been doing in the year and a half since Donald Trump let him off the hack. Now, Donald Trump promised, I'm going to solve the North Korea problem, either diplomatically or militarily, and he failed to go back to the military option. And it's my estimation that, that North Korea is the trigger event for World War III. It's the perfect trigger event because it got the appearance of an unstable, crazy leader that's controlled by China. So they can start the war with Kim Jong-un and China can say, oh, we don't control this guy, you know. Mm-hmm. But in order for the U.S., their troops are, you know, 16,000 or so combat troops there and 60-some thousand North Korea, or South Korean troops, we can't possibly win against a million-man invasion from North Korea unless you use tactical nuclear weapons. And I think that's the trigger of it. China will say, ah, oh, you used nuclear weapons first, you started it, and they use it to issue of a nuclear first strike against U.S. military targets. Now, the U.S. military knows that China and Russia do not intend to strike cities per se. They know that they're hitting for military targets and then try to blackmail the West into submission. Hmm. They do not want to destroy the Western economic base that keeps them alive. I mean, communists have never been able to feed themselves, let alone produce technology. And so what they've stolen and what they've uh, spied upon and got from the United States has built up what they have. But still, they could go downhill again unless they control the United States. So they want to nuke the U.S. military forces. And it's unfortunate that our own deep state conspiracy wants our forces nuked and is going to let that first strike fall. Even though we have the capacity to launch on warning, in 1997, President Clinton signed into law what the disarmament people wrote as a complete revamp of U.S. nuclear posture called Presidential Decision Directive 60. And you can, your listeners, if they're skeptical of what I'm saying, uh, can read a copy. It's classified. You can't see exactly what it is. But one of the authors, Craig Cernillo of Arms Control Today, a rabid disarmament expert who helped write it, wrote a summary of it in 1997 in the November issue of Arms Control Today. You can see it, armscontroltoday.org. Go to the November 1997 archives and you can read it. And he is writing this because the Washington Post came out and said, no, no, PD6 still allows launch on warning. You don't have to worry about it making us unstable. They came out and said, no, no, it doesn't. It prohibits missile forces from launching on warning. Hmm. And they must, re- they must absorb a nuclear first strike. Now, if your military listeners know anything about missile technology, the one who launches second in a missile strike wins because the first launch is detected by our satellites. And while those missiles take 20 minutes to a half an hour to get on target, we launch our missiles. Their missiles hit empty targets and ours then are retargeted for live targets. Mm. So launch on warning is an essential, crucial part of the spoke of self-defense in nuclear technology, and PDD-60 disallows it. And I think 
The globalists did that clear back then. And I don't think President Trump has ever been told about it. I think he'd want it changed if he had been told. But, you know, he doesn't know anything except what they tell him. And he's surrounded by glo globalists. But in any case, the globalists want this because it's the only way to talk Americans into a militarized global government like the EU. Mm. And, you know, the EU is all about you own it. It's, you're still free. You read the EU constitution. It talks about guaranteed rights. But there's a little fine language, except when society needs your land or except when society needs your property. You see. There's all these caveats in there. And that's why the Brits want it out. And they were, by the way, sabotaged by Boris Johnson and Theresa May. They told them that they had successfully gotten out with the breakfast, but the fine print keeps them really tied to all the regulations in the EU. And in addition, the Brits have been secretly funding the new EU army. And the British public doesn't even know about it, but they've been secretly funding the new EU army, which I believe is going to provide, is going to be the seed stock for the new global army once the U.S. army is, is decapitated. But you can see that if we allow a Russian-Chinese first strike to fall on military targets and our military is decapitated, it's easy for our leaders to come out of the bunker and say, oh, we didn't know this was going to happen. But now that our military is decapitated, we have only one way to survive, and that's to join in the, with other nations in a militarized global government to save us. And who's going to say nay? You look at what they did with COVID-19, a falsified pandemic, and everybody bowed down, or not everybody, but almost everybody bowed down and said, oh, yes, we have to keep ourselves safe. Well, you think you absorb a nuclear first strike, and that's why I'm telling. If you've got children heading for the military, tell them to stay out, because they're, this government is not going to protect them when World War III comes along. And that's why, as a former military officer, I'm telling you, uh, and, uh, you know, and our own military leaders aren't going to protect us. They go through the National War College. It's all taught by globalists. They, they indoctrinate them in the wonders of globalism and all of this stuff. And I'll tell you, if anybody protests and shows that they're not a team player, they don't, they don't make general officers. You know, you start mm -hmm. National War Colleges when you're colonel, lieutenant colonels, and they don't make general officers if they don't buy in, or they don't, if they don't drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Joel, that's this why all of our general officers, all of our general officers are globalists. I mean, Millie and the Joint Chiefs and all that stuff, the SB, you know, the defense minister, they're just all globalists. And that's why they don't want Trump. And they probably wouldn't follow his orders if he wanted to do what's right. It's all starting to remind me of scripture and revelations in the, uh, you know, end times, to be honest yep. with you, in the... Uh, you know, all of that that goes along with the Antichrist and uh, all of that stuff. I mean, how, how, how closely parallel do you think that Scripture is with what's actually going on here? I think the mark of the beast comes with this new global government. I think at some point they'll require a new oath of allegiance, mm. a new citizenship, a, to be a global citizen. And if you don't take the oath, in the, which will could involve vaccines, it could involve but whatever it is, you're not going to be able to be a professional, you won't be able to hold a job at a major corporation. In other words, that's the restriction, you won't be able to buy or sell if you don't have the, and I don't know what the mark may be, it could be a, a digital tattoo, you know, that indicates that you are a citizen, you've had your vaccines, that you've had all this. But that's why I see COVID dovetailing with this global agenda is they want Americans to be trained to be compliant. And Americans heretofore has been resistant, but we didn't see this coming, that they'd use the false honor that we have for the medical establishment to get everybody to say yes. And it's, fortunately, some people are starting to wake up, but unfortunately it's nowhere near like Germany. You had a million man march protesting the restrictions of COVID in Germany, and you can hardly get a few hundred people at a time in a major city to protest these things. and. And, and to me, that proves that in Germany, a large, a much larger percentage of people get their information from the web and alternative sources, whereas in Americans, they still watch the evening news and they still trust government. And it's a real sad commentary. Except for that 3% of Americans out there um, that just don't. Now, <clears throat> this brings me into uh, next question I have for you, which 
some are saying out there, and you're hearing more and more people saying, um, talking about a potential civil war, Lord forbid. Now, if this were to happen, um, can you give us any idea from your expertise, A, number one, what this might look like, and B, kind of how we could stay safe or prevail as private citizens through something like that? Well, if it ever came to citizens having to defend ourselves, we would win hand down, hands down because the left is not well armed and they're not well trained. And they could be easily taken down. And we have shown this every time a militia has got together to defend private property against Black Lives Matter and Antifa, which were a bunch of communists that the globalists have hired. They pay their way. We proved they bought them luxury buses with Black Lives Matter painted on them to bust them around the country. This is typical of the strategy, by the way, let me just say, typical of the strategy, the globalists have always uh, used communists to break down the social order, used communists to create war and conflict, so they can come in with their less than communist solution, the appearance that you're still free under us, but it's still socialism, it's called Fabian socialism, where you own it, but we control it. But they used the communists, I mean, we built up Soviet Russia, there were two payments of $20 million in gold to the communists, one from Jacob Schiff out of New York and the other out of the globalist in the Anglo-American or the British who, who, who helped them. And then we cut off aid to the white Russians so that the communists could win the revolutionary war there. Then we financed um, uh, all of the Lend-Lease to Russia. We gave them the rest of the plans to the nuclear weapons that they couldn't steal in the Manhattan Project. We gave them, and most Americans don't know this, we gave them the first shipment of enriched uranium so that they could explode their first atomic bomb a year after Hiroshima. The Russians didn't know how to enrich uranium. So even though they had the plans, they couldn't build a bomb huh. until we gave them the enriched uranium. Now that's treason. But it was done under the cause of Lim Lease that Russia's an ally. This was even after the war, by the way ceased to become our allies. They'd already taken over Eastern Germany. They'd all, we'd already done Operation Keelhaul and given all those Russian and Eastern Europeans back to Stalin to put in his concentration camps. Then we brought Mao Zedong to power by George Catlin Marshall, who cut off aid to Chiang Kai-shek so that the communists could win. We brought Castro to power by shipping him surreptitiously arms. Uh, George Bundy, a globalist under the Kennedy administration, cut off the air power to the Bay of Pigs invasion. Kennedy was so incensed about that, he vowed that he was going to disband the CIA, and that's why I think they killed him. So, but as to the sentiment of civil war, I don't think there's a real sentiment for civil war because there aren't two major groups that want to kill each other. There's only one-sided civil war, meaning it's only the Black Lives Matter, Antifa, leftist revolutionaries and they're hyped up now. They think because they've got all this money flowing in that, that our side is really powerful now. They don't realize the globalists are going to betray them at some point. Mm. But not until after, in fact, they'll burn the country down or try to if Trump gets reelected. And if Trump doesn't get elected, they'll still continue the harassment because they know that it will goad Biden and Harris into giving them what they want. And that's one of the purposes of the socialists funding them so that they can have an excuse to buy them off with socialist programs that the Democrats want to put into power anyway. So I don't think there's going to be a real civil war, but I'll tell you, if the police really did stand down, and let me tell you, even in Seattle and Minneapolis, the, the citizens have had it with these mayors who have been defunding police. Seattle is turning into a homeless nightmare. They're taking over neighborhoods all over. Tents are springing up. The word is out. Go to Seattle and get all this free money. I'll tell you, the citizens are leaving Washington State in droves, just like California. I used to consult a strategic relocation. Now you two or three times a day. And 90% of the people I consult with are coming out of California and Washington and Oregon, wanting to get out of these socialist states. There's, uh, there's been a mass exodus from New York City as well. You know, I live right around there, and I've seen it firsthand. All the skyscrapers are starting to become at night, right. dark windows. And, yeah. you know, you would think that this, uh, this freaking fool, he wouldn't have been reelected, but he was. And how? I don't know. But Wow. Yeah. Com Como is, uh, and de Blasio, these are just two. They're not actual communists. They're actually globalists. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, they're imposing their social solutions in there to create chaos and social unrest. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, I, don't, I don't see an end in sight, frankly. I'm not optimistic. Even if Trump gets reelected, they'll still continue to want to burn down the country. And, and even the Republican governors have gone along with this COVID mania. Yeah. Even though Kathy Noem of South Dakota didn't shut down the economy, she still closed the schools, which are totally unnecessary because the school kids aren't susceptible to COVID. And this is just a terrible. Uh, although the, the benefit of closing down the public schools and causing them now to wear masks to reopen is that millions, and I say millions, have started homeschooling and they bailed out of the public yes. schools. That's a real benefit. That's been a blessing in disguise, for sure. Yes. Another blessing in disguise, I think, that it, this is waking more and more people up. More and more people out there are starting to say, hey, you know, even if they're still watching that mainstream stuff, fake news, right? Communist news network. But even if they're still kind of in that mind state, they're saying, I need to prepare. I need to get set and, like, freaking snap out of it. I need to have at least two weeks of food and water or whatever supplies at home. I need to have possibly a vacation cabin out in the woods where I can go to, not if, but when things get hectic. And that's why strategic relocation is selling off the bookshelves. It's just incredible. I mean, uh, we're selling, um, it's number 4,000 on Amazon, which in millions and millions of books, that's very, very high. And, uh, and you guys are on your fourth edition now, am I correct? Yes, fourth edition. I do cover the COVID phony pandemic in this edition. And um, so it's, it's right up to date with all the statistics. And uh, I encourage people to get it, however, rather than Amazon from my website, joelscousen.com. Amazon's just a predator, you know, yeah. mentality. And it's just really sad trying to deal with Amazon. And they make you pay for everything rather it's uh, so I prefer people get it from my website. I always tell people, look, try to go to the actual website itself, support the author because otherwise right. you're just supporting Amazon. And I think we right. all know kind of what Amazon yeah, is. They're, they're, he's a globalist. Bezos is a globalist. Yeah, yeah. Hardcore. And, yeah, and Google is too. Facebook. They're all part of this conspiracy to censor what is true. It's getting to be a real battle, you know, to get the truth out there because and that's part of the reason why, so many people haven't woken up. They Google vaccines and the dangers of vaccines, and all you get from Google is debunking sites. Yeah, yeah. Just, That's why I tell people don't go to Google. Go to DuckDuckGo or something like yeah. that. It will give you some more honest results. Yeah. You know, Joel, it's funny to me how you've got sites like Twitter, right, that are so actively censoring not only right-wing stuff, and I don't want to say right-wing, but not only you know right-wing, but also conservative. Mm -hmm. also censoring blatantly like just everything and they're the ones trying to say like they're anti-fascist but isn't that kind of the definition of exactly. fascist yeah, yeah yeah we're free market but we control you that's right right, right. that's what it's that's what it's all about another thing i just want to briefly mention about um the fourth edition of strategic relocation is you've actually got political and demographic changes in there as well so anybody looking to go ahead and try to get a bearing on hey, where is safe? This book wasn't written like 10 years ago. You've updated it, and it's literally got the up-to-date current information in it. That's right, yeah, on gun laws and everything. And it's still changing, though. It's hard to keep up because the states are trying to lock down on homeschooling to keep parents from withdrawing. The Homeschool Legal Defense Association is just busy day and night threatening counties and cities who are trying to create their own law, which is not lawful, to keep people from leaving the public school. And they're saying, no, that's illegal. You can't do it. So the Homeschool Legal Defense Fund is really an important organization to support. Now, let me also say, I think that your listeners and anyone who's young just starting out in life needs to be prepared to get out of the establishment because this vaccine, I believe, is going to be a requirement for every public school student. Hmm. And so you're going to have to get your kids out of the public schools in order to avoid the vaccine. Number two, you're going to have to start to research home birth by certified lay midwives, not nurse midwives who work under a doctor. Certified lay midwives that won't require a vaccine. Because I'll tell you, you've got a hospital birth and they won't, aren't going to give you your baby until you have it vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And once they've got your baby in their charge and they won't give it to you, you're out of luck. Can they really do that? They can just hold your baby? Absolutely. I had a subscriber. 
who was doing home birth, had a complication, had to go to the hospital. This is before the vaccine, but they wouldn't let her have her baby unless they submitted to a whole list of vaccines that they wanted to give them that isn't the COVID vaccine. But if they're going to do that, you know they're going to add the COVID vaccine to it. Yeah. So you've got to do homeschooling, you've got to do home birth, and you're going to have to prepare to have your kids be entrepreneurs and not have to go get a degree in a university because I'm convinced all of these universities have been the biggest yes men to this mask mania and social distancing and contact tracing on their cell phones and closing down colleges. They're going to mandate that vaccine as a condition of going to university. And so I say the hell with them. Learn to be entrepreneurs. Learn a skill and a trade where you don't have to go to a university. Do apprenticeship if you have to. But I'm afraid you're even going to have to get out of jobs with major corporations who are also yes men. You know, in the state of Utah, where I live, they have no mask mandate. But all the major corporations in Utah requiring you wear a mask in order to go to the grocery store or to Walmart or Target or any of those things. Now, it isn't enforced very heavily because they know there isn't the real mass mandate, but it shows that these major corporations are yes men to the establishment. And I wouldn't put it past them someday to require for safety of their employees that every employee has to be vaccinated. So be prepared to move on to a job that will be more free or to start your own work. Well, what I try to tell people is, hey, work your day job while you're figuring out what you w- really want to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and, and make sure you get well-rounded. I mean, even if you're preparing to be a lawyer, don't be a doctor because you've got to stay out of the medical establishment. Um, but if you're going to be a professional of any sort, learn a trade as well. You know, when I went to college, I took woodworking, metalworking, welding, I took every manual trade. I, and today I use it. I mean, I hardly ever have to hire a prepare a repairman. I know how to fix cars. I know how to fix washing machines. I know how to fix my tractor. I know how to fix, I, I built several houses and shops and things. So you can learn all this stuff. You don't have to go to school for it. I learned most of this stuff just on the job, tinker around, working with other people. It's amazing what you can pick up if you put your mind to it and you don't have to go to school formally for it. And you can learn almost anything on the YouTube now in terms of of uh, fixing a car or appliances, just Google the make and model a car and the problem, and there it is, somebody willing to teach you how to fix it. No, absolutely, and I think the more well-rounded we are, the inevitably the uh, the better we'll be able to survive and make it through whatever happens. And what I like exactly. to try to tell people personally is, hey, we need everyone out there to really prepare so that if something happens, all of the good people can come back fighting, right? That was a World War II kind of slogan. If we're prepared, we can come back fighting. And I really think that that is an essential thing to think about. And exactly what you're saying right now to everybody is, hey, stay prepared, get prepared, stay prepared, so that we have a better chance of creating something, you know, at another point and resisting what right. is inevitably going to come. You know, people don't realize that, you know, there have been warnings about EMP strikes, but remember, only Russia and China have the eight or nine weapons that it takes to really take down the entire grid. Not just one or two, it takes eight or nine weapons, high altitude nuclear strikes to take down the grid. But they're going to be panic and a Mad Max scenario in every major city within three days after that. And I'll tell you, the jobs aren't coming back for, if ever. Yeah. Because when you destroy a city through pillaging, it's just hard for every, anyone to pick up the pieces. And it, it, you know, the electricity in most areas won't come back for about six months. I expect that they're going to be famine for an entire year. So you really have to have your stockpiles up and you have to hopefully get a growable piece of, of ground somewhere outside the city where you can grow a garden with a friend or family and, and pitch in together to, uh, to help. I mean, I'm a real believer in storage and, um, one of the things in my book, The Secure Home, I talk about you need to have basement space in any residence where you can put a, a concealed high security shelter and safe room. Not only are you going to, even though the cities will not be struck except where military targets are, uh, the blast zone of a nuclear weapon is only at a maximum of about 10 mile circle. Outside of that, you're only dealing with fallout, which is pretty easy to defend against. It just really takes most areas about 12 inches of concrete, which you can do with concrete blocks. 
over a steel decking in a small room within your, uh, your shelter system. But you need to have concealed space because there will be pillaging. You know, when there are crowds coming down the street and going to pillage if you don't, if you live within a suburban or urban area, you know, you're not going to be shooting masses of people who are just hungry. Um, that's just not going to play. The best strategy, the best tactic is to get out of the way and hide with your valuables so that they can come through and take whatever they can find in the cupboard and they go out. Leave your doors open. You know, don't, don't have them break down the house. And let them go on because pillagers do. They pillage and then they move on. And, uh, you know, in a few cases, you might have to root them out, but that's why you've got guns and ammunition. And you can do that. They don't expect anybody to come up from the basement, but that's where you come up from. I heard once that you're going to want to strew some clothes around and stuff so that people think, oh, this house has already kind of been hit. Yes, that's a good point, too. (laughs) <laughs> and don't leave much you know mm-hmm. the first group of through is going to clean out anything that's left but don't so don't bother leaving very much they'll see if it's all a mess uh, it's already been pillaged and they'll move on so but the it's important to have good concealment and i usually when we design high security residences and retreats we usually design a safe room behind another safe room mm-hmm. so that you have to find a concealed entrance to the first room and then people think oh we found it and you have a a phony safe in there that's got a few trinkets and things, and then they have to find another concealed entrance in the, to find the second, the real hardened safe room that's got hardened steel doors and concrete based, et cetera. Now, so, the firefighter in me has really got me wondering, um, is there a secondary exit for this? or Absolutely. Is there of- we always design a secondary exit out of the concrete box. Um, even if it's only one that you have a, a trap door that you dig out of slightly, you know, that, you know, doesn't lead. You have to make sure that's very concealed too. So somebody doesn't come in through the back door, but there's a lot of different things about strategies. You can see we don't publish that in the book because we don't want to get that in the public, yeah. but we provide the principles so that you can figure out, you know, how to do that. Now, if guys and girls out there wondering, you know, they want more information about this and they're thinking to uh, do this at home or have somebody yeah. assist them, can they get in touch with you and um, get more information about this? Yeah, most of my information is all on our, uh, in my books. So let me just tell you the two differences in, in the secure books for home. The, the st- secure home book is 700 pages long. It's the Bible of high security construction. Everything from bulletproofing walls, windows and doors to solar systems, generators, uh, concealment, safe rooms, how to do the exits, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we cover the full range of preparedness in that book. Now that's mostly new construction or remodeling. We have one special book called the High Security Shelter Book that is specifically for doing a safe room in an existing basement, which is most people's cheapest alternative. Mm-hmm. Complete architectural plans, including concealment, on how to do that safe room out of concrete blocks reinforced with a a block ceiling that you put into place one block at a time and uh, how to do the exits out of that. Uh, It talks about the solar. You want to make sure that you have complete independent power inside that safe room. So if they cut off the electricity, you're not in the dark in there. You've got your own battery supply. We talk about the latest batteries, which are the best for security. And, uh, you know, you could have even a solar charging system that's disconnected from the charges, the batteries in the safe room, but how to do ventilation, how to do the plumbing. And most of all, most importantly, how to do this without a permit because you don't want to have plans to a safe room on file in the county. And that's one of the advantages of doing it in an existing basement because there's no inspection. Now, are you guys running batteries so that there's not the noise from a generator? And something yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. 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 We like lithium ion phosphate batteries because they have very, very deep cycle down to 80%. Lead acids down to about 30%. You got to recharge lead acid batteries even under charging constantly will go bad in about 10 years these lithium ion phosphate batteries are essentially lifetime batteries and uh, now they cost about 10 times more than lead acid but the price is coming down and they last much longer so that when you took take of total capacity over the lifetime of the battery the lithium ion phosphate is still the cheapest over a 10 year period than lead acid because it lasts so much 
you can how do are, uh, and I know this is all in the book, but I just right. want to get a vague idea for our guys and girls as well, is um, what's really getting me is the ventilation here. Um, are you running some kind of system, uh, ventilation system? And Right, and it's very important. when you, We do have 12 or 20 volt, four volt fans that run off the, the battery bank directly. But the most important thing about ventilation is that you've got to have it go up through the wall into the attic or in where the filters are in a concealed cabinet so that one people can't hear. Because if you if you have a vent going right outside and somebody puts their ear down there to that vent, they can hear every word that's being whispered in a safe room. So that defeats the purpose of security. That's why we put them up into the attic so that it comes up so that a person can't get their ear close to that uh, or find where the exits to these come off. So we talk about filtration. We've got alternative, we've got military grade filters that we list in the book. Some, the cheapest is about $2,000, but we've also got off the shelf household type things. Uh, you know, Honeywell puts out a series of filters that gives you almost identical to a military grade filter for about $300. So those kinds of options are the things we try to make the book worthwhile so that you know where to find those hard to find sources. Well, that's a book that I'm definitely going to be going ahead and purchasing. Um, now, I know you've got to run in a little bit, but I've got one or two more questions yeah. here from viewers that were really interested. And uh, one of our guys, actually our medical advisor for Gutter Fighting Secrets, he wanted to know if you um, advocate for a bug out route, placing caches or catches along a longer route so that you could um, potentially resupply yourself if you were forced on foot. Absolutely. Um, in my book, Strategic Relocation, for example, I talk about the, um, the obstacles you face in trying to get out of a major city. The biggest obstacles you face, for example, are the freeway systems. They're like a moat. You can't get across those freeways because most of the ways across the also are an entrance to the exit in the freeway. And like in Katrina, they're going to be jam-packed with cars. You won't be able to get through. But if you look on Google Maps very closely, follow the beltways around, you'll see places where there's no on-ramp or off-ramp that they go under or over the freeway and get outside. Those are the ones you want to isolate. Now, you want to make sure you, you, you're, you know, in any crisis, you're going to get out of a town faster on the residential streets rather than get on any of the secondary roads with stoplights. So map out your routes. And run. But at a certain point, you're going to run out of daylight and time and you're going to need to resupply. Uh, in fact, you may have to dump your car if you literally can't get it past certain roadblocks and go on foot. And so you have to have resupply. So it's very, very important to have stockpiles with friends that are in a rural area that you that you made arrangements in advance to have fuel, uh, oil for the car if you need it, uh, you know, food, water supplies. And usually the friend can supply you with some bedding to stay down for the night. You don't want to try to carry too much. You want to go light, uh, but you want to be armed if you're going to get out there on your own so that you can protect yourself. <clears throat> but even with people who do get out with a car, They've got to realize that, you know, you've got to stockpile fuel within your garage so that you can load up a, as much fuel as you can to, to bypass service stations, which may not be operating in a crisis. And when you get out toward that limit of your range, you want to make sure you have stockpiles of fuel in a residence or something that uh, you've got a prior agreement with a friend that will help you out. That's a good one about um, making an agreement with a friend along the way as opposed to trying to bury it in the ground or something like that. And remember, as a, as a pilot, former military pilot, I still fly privately, have my own airplane. That's the biggest bug out plan. If you have, if you're young enough to get a pilot's license, and it's not that difficult, it costs about $10,000, but it's a great investment. You can get a used airplane for as little, I mean, really good long range airplane, as little as $50,000. And while that may seem a lot, heck, a new truck costs you 60 grand now. Yeah or 75 but you think about if you have no other choice but you have to get several states away don't mess around with trying to do that on the roads roads you know leapfrog over that i don't care if they shut down the airspace system nothing can keep me from flying low below the radar and just get out of town that's brilliant and that actually brings me into the last question i have for you perfectly is 
what about fleeing the country while borders are closed down? I mean, is there a way to manage this, uh, this risk? Well, it's something I don't recommend. Now, I do cover in strategic relocation all the, the normally known international retreat scenarios, Latin America, Central America, Spain, uh, parts of uh, Europe, Scandinavia. I cover all those countries, the do's and don'ts, et cetera. But I want to tell you this. In COVID-19, every one of the Latin American countries, which are the prime destination for Americans, they heard all the expat stories about how cheap you can live in Costa Rica or Guatemala. <laughs> and I've lived down there in many of these countries. And I can tell you, you don't make relocations, international decisions based upon current conditions because in COVID-19, almost every one of those countries locked down so fast they wouldn't even let people out of the country. Now think about it. It's one thing to not let people in the country if you go, but they wouldn't let you as American tourists get out of the country. Oh, wow. They wouldn't even let Americans out. That's right. No, you couldn't get out. I had pilots friends who were taking a tour with various of their airplanes down in Latin America, and they literally had to take off in the middle of the night in violation of the thing and, and, and just flee the country by air because the, the borders were closed. You couldn't drive out of the country. They had blocked everything. So believe me, in Latin America, these are future tyrannical countries and uh, you just don't want to take a chance. They're going to have vaccine mandates because they don't have the constitutional history. The only thing that's kept the United States alive is because Republican governors fear the conservatives in their state. And so they're reluctant. You know, the corporations are talking about lockdown, but the governors themselves, most of the Republican governors have been refusing to do mass mandates because of fear of the backlash and it will be coming. So I'm saying be very careful about international retreating because in the war, even though these countries will not be hit with nuclear weapons, their economies will go to zero because all the tourism is going to stop. They're all socialist countries. They can't sustain themselves without external commerce. And they're going to start to confiscate American bank accounts. And, other mm -hmm. and you want to try to get back to the U.S. under war conditions 2,000 miles away, you're kidding yourself. It's going to be very, very difficult. So I say the United States is the safest place, even though our military is going to get hit because there are millions of potential supporters here. In Latin America, I could count on two hands the number of people who really understood the things of liberty and be willing to fight. for. But in America, you got millions of potential resistors, and that's where I'm going to make my stand. Me as well. And... Uh... Joel, I appreciate you so much coming on. I could honestly sit here with you for another hour, but I know you've got some things you need to take care of. But thank you so much for coming on, my friend. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, and God bless to all of your listeners. Guys, until next time, I want you to remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will catch you in the next Tactical Podcast.